So I'm thrilled to be partnering with Fang again. I've partnered with other chapters um, around the country, Florida and Chicago, and um, just love it. So happy to be here. And lots of, of um, folks in this room that I haven't met before and haven't seen your names on, on the screen before. So it's great to meet new people. And, and it's also great to have old friends on as well, right? So, and I, I say that old friends, meaning longtime friends, which is a better way to say it. <laughs> I'm, I'm the old friend on this side. So um, the, the topic for today is the topic of my book. It is the topic of my life right now, which is bulletproofing your career for life. Um, so the, the major thing um, that was said in my introduction is important. And that is that I really am on a mission to get everybody to fundamentally change their relationship with their career. And I want to explain to you that corporate America fundamentally changed its relationship with you, its employees, a long time ago. And we didn't catch the message and we kind of missed it. Um, and that's, that is when the, what I call the disruption, the churn that we have started to see happen. Now, when I talk about what I'm going to talk about tonight and getting you ready to be always ready to be ready um, and how the rules have changed. I want you to understand that it isn't, I'm not saying this because corporate America has taken a, an angry pill and is just meaner than it ever was. It's a simple fact. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to go back over a few pieces of my um, original Ted talk. If you haven't seen my Ted talk, um, it would be a really good thing to do after this, if you haven't done it yet. And it's just go on YouTube and search my name and you'll find it. Um, but the, the whole essence of it is, is just this, that the rules of, of engagement, if you will, from the employer to you has changed. So I'm going to show you some of the statistics that help explain it. Um, and then I'm going to get into a few more details about um, what the simple facts of life are about these changes. And then most importantly, some things that you not should be doing, but that you must be doing um, to bulletproof your career for life. And, and let me give you the simple definition of bulletproofing for life. It does, it's beyond, yes, you're in charge of your career, that if at any point in time, um, as happened to somebody I was uh, speaking to today, somebody walks in your office and says, or invites you into their office more often because HR has to be there and they say, we're going in a different direction, that you say, interesting, because I'm going in a different direction too. And you already have two or three options lined up in the sense of good relationships. You've talked to people and they've said, if you're ever looking, we'd like to talk to you further. We might have something for you in the future. So you've already got ducks in a row and it's, no, it's not a surprise, right? Because what prompted me to write my book, quite honestly, was that people um, kept reaching out to me for coaching and saying, I never saw it coming. It was a complete surprise. And that shouldn't really have to be, right? So that's the whole essence of it. Now, let me take you through just a few of the uh, ingredients of my TED Talk for those of you who haven't seen it or for those of you who have seen it, but it's been a while. So the average tenure... Um, of an S&P company, um, standard, a company being on S&P 500, being on the S&P 500, sorry, um, in 1965, a company would, would go on to the S&P 500 and remain in that hallowed territory for 33 years. And those were the years when you got the gold watch. Those were the years when people worked for 25 years, because if a company's on the S&P 500 for a long time, it means there's not a lot of disruption going on. They're really stay, staying at the top of the heap and at the top of their game. And that's the way it was in 1965. In 1990, that had dropped to 20 years. So now, um, as of 1990, it was that the average company was on the S&P 500 for 20 years. The prediction is that in just six years from now, um, five years actually almost, um, it's predicted that the average tenure for a company on being on the S&P 500 will be 12 years. So this isn't 10 years of people in the company, it's the company itself remaining in on the S&P 500. So when you see that it is cut more than in half between 65 and 2027 and, and sizably um, from 1990 to 2027. Uh, and we're probably very close to that 12 years. I haven't seen the stats um, for current, current, this study hasn't redone their study. Um, but when, when you're having a company being disrupted like this, that means, guess what? The people inside the company are being disrupted, right? Um, so um, another little snapshot of this is, 
This was the list of the companies in the top 12 of the S&P 500. And back in 2000, you know, you see the hallowed General Electric and you see Pfizer and you see um, Citigroup and, you know, companies that we've all known and respected Cisco, right? Um, when by the time we get to 2015, many of them have disappeared. And, and by the time we got to 2018, um, when I did, uh, did the uh, presentation, um, if you do the comparison virtually, there's I think there's only three or four companies um, left on the S&P, uh, the top 12 of the S&P for market capitalization um, in 2018 as started in 2000. I can tell you that <clears throat> I've looked at this again for 2021 and um, there are three more people who have fallen off of the 2018 list and um, Visa is one that has been added up to it. Um, NVIDIA, which is a gaming company, has uh, come on and replaced. Um, Alibaba is one of the ones that fell off. Tencent fell off. And I'm trying to remember the third one um, that I know for sure fell off. I think it might have been Johnson & Johnson, but they might show back up after the COVID vaccines, right? But the point again is that this is massive disruption. These are companies that used to keep people for 25 years and give them the golden watch. And now with the disruption, they can't keep their head above water in, in many ways. This is really an interesting. So when I did the, um, this is very important to understand. So when I did the um, S, the, the TED talk, the, uh, the numbers of the um, uh, tenures of folks, right? Um, I'm showing you the, the difference. So it's in white was what it was in 2018 and what it is now um, having rechecked in 2021. So as of January, 2020, the number of years, the median tenure went from 4.2 to 4.1. But the real telltale is down here. The CEO um, average tenure, um, and this is a, a study that Corn Ferry does, um, the average uh, CEO's tenure was eight years. It is now 6.9 years and their average age is 59. Um, CFO, very important. It was 5.1. It is now 4.7. Average age is 54. The CHRO went from 5 to 3.7. And I think that is reflective of a very, there's two um, numbers here that are very reflective of massive changes in certain um, organizations within inside of a company. One of those is human resources and the other one is marketing. Um, but in human resources, it went from five years to 3.7. The CIO, it looks optimistic. They went from 4.3 to 4.6. But as if you, they further went on to break it out by uh, sectors and the, and the healthcare sector is an average of 3.9 years. That's reflective of massive technology changes in the healthcare uh, environment, right? And then the CMO, um, has the shortest tenure C-suite, um, has gone from 4.1 years to 3.5 years and age 54. And I think that the, the role of the CMO is changing so dramatically um, that I, I don't know when to predict it, but someday that, that role will virtually disappear. It might be chief digital officer. Um, it'll, it'll be something different, it'll morph, but that marketing role is reflective of the changes. Now, um, I'm going to go back on uh, slides in a little bit, but I, I wanted to, to tell you something. If you're listening to that and thinking, well, thank goodness I'm not in the C-suite because that looks, that looks a little scary, right? The, the issue is that if there is disruption in the C-suite, there is disruption throughout the company. Uh, I have a client who um, was hired in January in an SVP role reporting to the CEO. 60 days later, that CEO had left. Um, and she, by the way, joined that company because of that CEO, that CEO left and an interim CEO was in place. 30 days later, the interim CEO had left and there was a new, so new CEO. So in 90 days, she had three new CEOs and she survived. We were, we had a lot of things going on to, she's in my onboarding program, making sure that she could, but a lot of people did not because when the C-suite changes, they bring in, they often bring in their people and then their people bring in their people and they bring their new ideas. So any disruption at the top is going to eventually trickle down. And so you have to be very alert to that, okay? So one of the things I wanna to emphasize today before I talk about the actions you need to take, this is a first one. It's not particularly in the, in the seven things that I talk about in the slides. It's sort of the umbrella. Um, when I say fundamentally change your relationship to your career, I want you to realize that the relationship change, change on the other side was in the old days, we would 
we would make a, a pretty good promise to you. Um, and they could because they were not being disrupted like they are. Um, so their promise would be, you come here, you do a great job, you do, do what we need and, and a little bit more, um, and we'll have a place for you, right? And they could make that promise because things weren't changing rapidly. Now along comes the disruptors. So uh, let me give you another stat that explains how immense the disruption is going on right now. When I did the TED talk, I talked about the unicorns category. Unicorns are companies that have reached a billion dollar market valuation rapidly, right? Um, when I did the TED talk, there were 200, just over 200 companies in that category. In March of 2021, that number rose to over 600. As a matter of fact, it was over 640. It was something in that mid, mid 600 range. So in just a couple of, about two and a half years, it went from a couple hundred to 600 and something. And here's what you need to know. Every single one of those disruptors, every single one of those unicorn companies, mostly in fintech, insure tech, ed tech, usually they end in tech, um, home uh, healthcare is certainly um, highly represented in the list of 600. Um, when, when those companies come on the scene, one of the things that they're out to do is to disrupt the lead dogs in the pack to go after the market share, to go after their customers and to take them away from the big, big folks that have gotten a little bit too big, right? So the disruptors come in or the, that many unicorns come in and they're disrupting companies right and left, right and left, right and left. So that's causing, just gives you an idea of that rate of disruption, right? So companies just simply can't make that promise anymore. And so you have to make a different promise back. Your promise back has to be, I'm going to come here. I'm going to do a good job. But you have taught me something, Mr. and Mrs. Corporate America. You have taught me that no matter how good I perform, when you're ready by necessity to make a, in, in most cases, by necessity, when you need to make a reorganization, when you need to do an acquisition or to divest, when you need to be acquired, when something needs to change, no matter how good my work has been, if I'm not in the future picture, I'm gone. It's not like in the old days, you did a great job. We're going to keep you around and get that gold watch fitted for you. Don't you worry, we'll find a place for you. Um, it just isn't happening. So you, they don't pro can't promise you and you can't promise them. Now, I am not in any way, shape or form in any of this discussion asking you not to do, go in and do a good job. Um, I will say that I don't want you to go in and do a, a job that you get hired that's a, a, a particular salary and that salary is based on an average of 40 to 45 hours a week and you're working 60 to 70 right away you've just taken a pay cut and I'm seeing some of that happen. But not only does that, does that mean that you're, you're kept away from your family and from things that you wanna do, but it means that you don't carve out any time for yourself in your career and that's where you fall behind, right? So my major um, request for everybody is that I know that you put a lot of time and energy and it's exhausting doing a job search I don't want you to ever have to do that job search again. So I don't need you to maintain the level of activity that you do now if you're in a full-time job search. But here's what I do know, that the old paradigm was I, I do a great job. I, I get into my job. I put my head down. I pay attention to nobody and nothing except for doing a great job. They decide they don't need, need me. I'm out here. I have to crank back up my network. I have to find the recruiters who are interested in me. I have to get my resume updated and all those things. And you're starting from ground zero. And then you go back in and you put your head down again, because this time you think, it's, I just need to work a little bit harder. They just didn't see how good I was. They'll see how good I am this time. And then the same thing comes around, not because they're cruel, but because it's the reality, right? So I need you to make a commitment to yourself that you'll never be too busy to take responsibility for your career. Because as, as she stated in my intro, um, nobody's going to care as much about your career as you. Absolutely nobody right? So you need to take that responsibility. Um, and I don't want you to, you really don't need to be in another uh, full-time job search, right? So let's, let's pop on and start going through the, the seven steps of things. I'll, I'll amplify them a little bit um, on each one um, and hopefully give you some things to really think about action. But if you don't make, there's a fundamental commitment you have to make. And that first fundamental commitment is 
I am no longer going to assume that my past performance is going to uh, help me maintain this role. And I'm also not going to continue to assume that this company that I thought was the best is going to be the dominant in their category with all of this disruption coming along, okay? So let's go back over for a sec and, go, and walk through some of these, right? So um, the biggest, most important thing is for you to cultivate and curate a very broad community, especially a networking community, especially in um, emerging sectors and industries. And for those of you in the, in the New York um, area where financial market is everything, um, the, um, the insights list that I'm talking about, the unicorns list, and um, Jackie, I will make a, a folder with follow-up from this call and I'll have that list in there for everybody with the um, companies and it's broken out by sector um, so that you can start to see what, what companies are emerging, right? So you may be sitting here now and saying, I've, I've looked at some um, uh, FinTech companies and there's some that are very fast growing, very much at the top of the unicorn category and maybe in the decacorn category. And you've been thinking, I, see, I wish I could get into there. I just can't get my way into there. This is why that's what cultivation is all about. So typically when you're in your role, you create this cocoon of connections, right? And that cocoon usually consists of your department, maybe, maybe one department over, maybe, but if you're in a large organization, it doesn't consist of connections outside of your immediate um, area. Matter of fact, it may not, you may be in an organization that has multiple divisions um, and you're not creating those connections in other divisions. So I've coached people where, you know, the division that they're in is shrinking, but there's other divisions growing that are going. Cisco is the, is the major client that I've done this in. There's other divisions that are growing on the cloud side that are taking off and you've got to cultivate and curate people in that part of your own company. But you also want us to, to be identifying target companies that would be um, companies that you might want to uh, engage with in the future and that might be saying that's going to be the biggest disruptor in my particular sector and start cultivating relationships inside those companies long before you know that there's an opportunity there or even think that there might be. Um, I was talking to somebody the other day and she said, well, that company is too small. They're not hiring anybody in my particular role. But she said, they'd probably hire me for this role. And I'd say, do you, I, I asked her, I said, do you really like the company? She said, oh man, it's the darling. It's growing so rapidly, right? And I said, then take the job that gets your foot in the door. And once they start to build out the department, you're already sitting there as an insider, not an outsider, right? So I want you to think differently about your network. And, and the biggest problem too, it's it's not only the, the um the curating the network, but the cultivating it, right? So in other words, where you identify people that could be and, and probably have built a great connection um, of network right now, you want to maintain those networks after you land. Whereas the typical um, situation happens is you, you, you intend to do it. It's 90 days, it's six months into the thing, and you realize you haven't reached back out to those people that you were reaching out to every 60, 90 days to look for, for help. So it's making a commitment that you're gonna get out of the cocoon of connections. You're gonna expand your network inside your company once you land, and you're going to greatly expand your network outside into sectors and industries that are growing and emerging and are gonna be the disruptors to wherever you are. Um, so if, if you wanna be a gigger for life, and, and all of these are traits, by the way, let me back up for a second and just tell you that the way giggers operate is that when a gigger walks into a company and takes on an, a new role, it takes on a, a, a contract, they right away are starting to identify, huh, what other departments in this company might I get another contract in? Who else in this company might hire me? How can I stay in these walls now that I know how to get in and out of the building and I actually have a badge? And this is or or in and out of this the uh, system if it's remote, um, but they're already doing this. So that's the way a gigger thinks, and that's what you need to think. Now, when they are in the role, um, it's very very common that a gigger will be doing a um, a contract, and somebody will say, you know what, I was talking to Joe and his department, and he has a another thing that needs to happen over there, right? Um, and 
I think you probably could do that. Do you want to talk to him about that? Absolutely. And, and don't, before they even ask what, what's the gig or what do they need me to do? They should say, yes, I want to talk to them, of course. Right. So they do a great job in their current role because they need to be, have that be referenceable. But at the same time, they are constantly keeping their eyes and ears open for what might be happening in another area of the company that might be an opportunity for them, right? So, and by the way, they may, they I tell you they're very common and this is very applicable for you. They may be asked to do, look, it's not gonna be a permanent, they just, they got stuck on something. Would you mind um, having going over there for a day and just helping them out with something and then we'll get back onto here? Absolutely, they would say, because they're going to get to make that relationship, they're going to get to be known, and they're going to get to be known for that work, right? Whereas, typically, um, oftentimes, it's head down, I don't have time for any of those things. Let me give you a good example of this. I was coaching somebody who had just taken on a role, and it was sales operations, but what she really, really wanted was to be in customer success, but it was a completely different department, and it, it had some, you know, some um, tangential crossover, but was not something that she had tried to get into those roles. Nobody would talk to her. And she said, okay, well, what do I do about that? Like, that's the gig I really want to do. And I said, okay, when you get in, you start courting the head of the customer success. And then you start saying to them, you know what, because I'm in sales, I really want to know what's going on at the other side. Once I sell, how's the customer being supported? Would you mind if I come down and just observe in the customer success um, you know, department where the, where the, um, the callers are um, and, and kind of observe? Absolutely, there'd be a great idea. What a great way. So she started going down and then she'd say, well, I'm going to get there a little early. I have some questions I want to ask you. So she'd start asking questions like I saw this and you know, I was thinking, I wonder if it would help them if we told them this or if they did this. Bottom line, she got to be known by the manager who said, when I have an opening, I'd love to talk to you about coming over to my department, right? So she could have just stepped in, stayed in sales, but by making herself known and being willing to go over there and add some value, he started to see that, you know, before when she would interview, they'd say, oh, sales operations, it's so different from what we need over here. You wouldn't be able to make the transition. And all of a sudden she was living proof that she could make this transition um, at, a, at a senior level. She had a, was a senior level executive at a senior level and he was happy to want to get her in there. That was being open to, to going over there and contributing um, you know, in a way that um, was extra work for her, but actually gave her great visibility, right? So it's, it's being willing to say, pick your head up inside and say, where can I be recognized? Um, it, within this own within this company, but maybe in another department. So let me share just one other um, good example of this. When I um, when I did my TED talk, there were ten people from Home Depot that came to. I did a table afterwards and moderated a table on a topic, and there were ten people at the table, all of them from Home Depot. So I I started asking them first, you know, what area of Home Depot uh, do you work in, and who do you what do you support? And all of them were connected to retail. And I said, so who do you know in the e-commerce side of Home Depot? Now this was before COVID, this was 2018. And they said, oh, e-commerce, no, I don't know anybody over there. So, well, that's interesting. So let me tell you some statistics that I happen to know because I did a little research before my, my TED talk. And what I found out was that there were that in uh, at that point in time for Home Depot, their retail business was growing by five percent. Their e-commerce business was growing by just a snap, a little bit under twenty five percent. So I said to them, "Have you looked at any postings in the uh, see if there's any internal postings in the um, e-commerce side?" They said, "No." I said, "You know, here's the thing: if they're growing by twenty five percent." and retail's only growing by 5%, which is not much for a big box company, um, there's probably gonna be a lot more hiring going on over there. And, there's, and I can tell you for a fact that they are throwing a lot of money in general at, in, in investments. If you go through your, uh, your 10K, you will see that they're putting a lot of money towards their e-commerce. Now it paid off in spades because Home Depot was one of the ones that 80% of their res, uh, revenue at one stage of, of 2020 was coming from e-commerce. Right. But the point was, none of these people, I said, now you, here's what you've got to do. 
You've got to figure out who do you need to know on the e-commerce side and who needs to know you so that when an opportunity is there, you can be in position because they would much rather hire somebody from inside than outside because you know the company and you know the culture, right? So it was a matter of making those connections within and being open to a gig on that side, which they had never even thought of, right? So here's the interesting thing about what giggers do. Um, they live and die by testimonials and referrals and recommendations. So when they go into an organization, they do their job, but they are very, very astute about making sure that other key decision makers, other key P&L holders who could hire them are aware of what they're doing. And they do that by the way that they engage their own client and make sure that the word sort of gets, gets out um, and as they're working interdepartment, intergroup, which a lot of the roles are, they're making sure that they make a name for themselves, right? Now they're not jumping up and down and 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 uh, carrying signs around, but they're very in a, in a very um, professional and subtle way. They're making sure that they know who's there, what work they're doing, and how successful they are at it, because that sets them up for their next opportunity. Um, for Internally, what I have found is that there tends to be, for corporate executives, um, there tends to be a, um, a feeling of you don't want to be a show off and you don't want to stand out. And that's, you know, don't be, don't be tooting your own horn. And there's a fine balance because somebody needs to know in that organization, beyond just your immediate boss, what you do and why it matters and the difference that you're making, right? So what you're doing, the difference that you're making. So um, I'm, I'm onboarding somebody right now who is doing a um, very big project for a very large grocery store. And it's, a, um, it's really a uh, data analytics and collecting customer data and turning it into actionable um, information. And so he's working with a data group, et cetera, but we did figure out who he needed to know and who needed to know him about this. And we knew that that person that he needed to know had a direct line to the CEO for whom this was an important product or a project, but my client wasn't going to get the visibility um, that he needed. And by just connecting to this one other person, he, he shared with him a couple of slides that, that were just, some, you know, just a side look, this is some of what I'm seeing. And I'm thinking that perhaps, you know, this other group could really use this, these, this data, even though we're collecting it for here. And the person who he intentionally got to know and, and dropped that hint to said, yeah, and I, I've got to, I'm going to be meeting with the CEO this afternoon. I want to talk to him about that. It, would you have time if he's available, would you have time to show him those slides? And he said, as a matter of fact, I think I could make time to do that, right? So guess what? He's now, he just got a promotion. He got in to see the CEO who said, well, we're, we're doing it over here. Let's extend your, your, um, your scope of your work. And let's also have you bring that over to this group and we'll, we'll roll those in. This is much bigger and producing much better results than, than he even knew, right? So he didn't necessarily jump up and down, but he just sort of said, I, I call it the Columbo approach. Hey, 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 I don't know if this would be important to you, but I just found this out, right? And that's how we got that visibility to the CEO. The other way that I want you to realize, so in other words, you don't have to be tuning your horn, but you want to look at what you're doing and say, who else inside this company should know that I'm doing this and to, who, to whom else will it matter? So that helps you with opportunities inside of your company because I'm not opposed to you moving around inside of a company. I just want you to have all kinds of options. Outside of the company, the, the way that you seek to stand out. Um, another one of my clients happens to also be in Chicago um, and she was just front and center on, on LinkedIn, not by her, but by her vendor. Um, she is uh, in marketing in a very large company that just IPO'd this year. And um, she got herself on, as a keynote speaker at their one of their key events for consumer goods, consumer products. Um, and um, there she was on the, on the head of, of uh, LinkedIn, but not her promoting it. It was the vendor, one of her key vendors who said, oh, Amy, congratulations on your parents and your, what a great presentation, right? So what's the, what's the takeaway here? Don't 
don't allow yourself to be so busy that when somebody says, hey, would you like to be on this panel? Could you do a webinar? Could you give a presentation? And your first thought is, oh my God, I can't even get through the day. I can't keep up. Do not let that happen. Make the time, find the times, and, and you're gonna have to carve it out of overproducing where it doesn't pay off and, and being visible where it will pay off and being on those panels and being in, it can be just a webinar. It can be writing an article, offering to write an article for your industry organization. There is such a demand for content, content, content that all you have to do is find out what's the publication or the blog that's the influencer in your in your industry and in your area in talking about what you know about finance in this part of the uh, what's going on um, in FPNA, what's going on here, what's trending, anything like that, so that you get that visibility and all of a sudden your name is is all over Google because when you're on a panel or et cetera like that, it's on there and it's just brand amplification, right? The, the main message is don't be shy. Panels are the safest way to go at first. It's not like you just on stage with a microphone, get on a panel. The, and these days that panel is usually a virtual panel. So it makes it easier and doable, but you want to set, I'm not saying that you do one, one a month, by the way, or even one a quarter, but at least once or twice a year, find some way to stand out broader than inside of your company, particularly in your industry. Um, I have another client here who's just um, uh, been on, he was on LinkedIn last night because he's on his second panel in, in nine months and it's he's in data analytics and financial services. Um, and it's he's gotten so much attention from that. And by the way, you may or may not know this, but I did this as a recruiter in my days of recruiting. Recruiters, go to find um, people who have spoken on panels and been industry leaders and subject matter experts within their industry. We are absolutely, we absolutely seek them out um, when we're in our process of recruiting. So it's, it, it's great to be able to say to the client, this person is a big influence in the industry. These are their presentations. This is the kudos that they've gotten, right? Um, hone your ability to adapt to change. So more important than Anything else, any skill, more important than any certification that you may be thinking about getting, unless you need licensing in particular uh, and renewal of licensing to do your job, um, any, the, the most important skill today, and this was true before COVID and it is amplified since COVID, the number one thing that people, you know, in hiring now, everybody's very risk averse. And one of the risks they don't want to have is they don't want to bring in somebody who cannot rapidly adapt to change. And it is not something that we just wake up ready, willing, and able to do by any stretch of the imagination, right? But when we think about the, the amazing disruption that we have uh, right now with, um, with COVID, I can tell you that in your interview process, for those of you are, who are interviewing, um, whether you know it or not, they are trying to decide, hmm, could this person manage a hybrid workforce? Could this person lead a team 100% remotely? Um, how will this person adapt if, as we shift, because many companies still haven't quite, they have in all honesty, not nail down what their re-entry plan is because there's too much um, uncertain. So if, if they haven't nailed down their re-entry plan, they want to know if you are going to be able to be nimble and adapt just to the workforce situation, right? Um, there's a couple of, of good books that um, I'll, I'll have a book or two in the recommendations when I create the um, follow-up for this, um, Laura, that's will help with that because it's really important. And when you're in the in the new role, it's going to be your biggest need to change and adapt is, you know, you're not going to have people there and you're not going to be able to call the meetings that used to be the great way to get the work done, right? <clears throat> or not have meetings, which used to be the better way to get work done. But the other part of change is I can tell you that when decisions are made, when their rooms are called together and there's going to be a shift either in something that they're being forced to do and it's going to result in downsizing. Part of the question as they look at the folks that are going to be tapped for that downsizing is, 
if we keep them, will they be able to adapt to the disruption that this acquisition is going to cause or this divestiture is going to cause, or we're going to take out a layer of, of support, we're going to take out a layer of management, and they'll look at the folks that, that are proposed to be left on board and say, which of these are the ones that have shown and demonstrated that they are the most adaptable to change, right? So you want, how do you, you not only need to hone your ability to do that. And I do also have some book recommendations that really focus on that, that are outside of just the um, re-entry and, and the things that we're talking about, but it's it's the thing to major in. It is, and by the way, here's, here's one of the things that um, I can tell you. So for a gigger, when they're in a role, um, they have to be like, very morphable because here's what will happen. Here's the original scope of the contract. And then the scope of the contract expands and then it changes again. And then the scope of the contract shrinks. So then they let a few people go because they're, the contract's gone. They had six people on the project. Now they have three. And then all of a sudden it explodes again. And then it morphs into something different and they've got to go out, tap into their network that they've been curating and cultivating and bring in subcontractors with them in order to keep the contract, right? So they demonstrate that all the time. Inside of a company, we get kind of just kind of really locked in to what we're doing and anything that comes as change is like, you know, it's sort of inside, you may not be saying it out loud, but inside you're saying, but everything was fine just the way it was. Well, it may have been, but it's not what's going to keep the company competitive, right? So how, when you're inside of the organization, you want to be demonstrating when something needs to change, whether you have to go um, outside and, 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 or into another room if you're working remotely and, and not let them see your reaction to it. But in front of anyone, you have to say, I'm flexible. Let's see where we go from here and at least keep that open mind. Um, it's going to be it's always been essential or has been essential in the last few years. It is just becoming more and more and more essential. So my counsel is to find ways. Now, interestingly enough, it's sort of a habit or a muscle that you can develop, right? So in other words, uh, again, we're not doing so much driving to, to and from work, but we are out and about and, and at least traveling, driving or, or um, um, taking buses and, and subways to places. Um, one of the ways to start to get better at adapting to change is to force yourself to do different things. Because here's what happens when you're trying to change. Um, you have a mechanism inside of you that wants to protect you. So when you start to do something that you never done before, you have an immediate physical reaction, whether you know it or not. It may not be wild, but it's enough so that there is a a change in, in internally, and that gets sensed. And when that gets sensed, your mechanisms that are there to protect you say, whoa, something's going to happen out there, and we don't know if that's safe, so we're going to hold you back. And that's where, where resistance to change sort of emanates from, okay? So what do you do about that? You start doing little tweaks, little changes. Um, again, in, in the days of commuting, um, my recommendation, and so for some of you may still have the ability to be more out and about, the recommendation was take a different route to work. If you always go um, to the left when you come out, of, come out of your street, go to the right and go, go around. The minute you start doing something different, you don't even notice it, but there's an internal reaction to it. And then when you do it and you survive and everything's just fine, that's your, your, your literally your brain and your mechanisms go, okay, well, change that change was okay let's see a few more so you keep stretching um in things that, that i've also encouraged is if you have a favorite you know restaurant that you go to like break out of that and go cross town and go to a different restaurant if, for those that are open um it's just doing simple little things and you think that's crazy uh, how how is going to a different restaurant going to help me adapt to change when they reorganize the entire department you will have a different reaction to it and you'll be able to, to see it more reasonably and recognize and say to you, you the reaction to your, your inner thermostat will be change isn't all bad. I need to take a look at this, right? So whatever you do, get your, become a student of how to adapt to change, right? So this is what we've been talking about from the very beginning, but when I say ownership and control of your destiny, um, let me give you a really vivid example of this that, that recently happened with a, a client of mine. This is an extreme. Um, this is a sort of before they landed extreme. And then we'll talk about some internally, right? So a client of mine um, was interviewing for a company that 
um, was kind of moving kind of slow. And then the, she had two really um, active interviews going on. The second one was the one she really wanted to go to. The first one was, okay, it would be an okay job. Um, she, we had talked and I asked the question that I ask all my clients at a point like this, if you get the first job, um, how will you feel? Cause she had already said, I, I, it's, it was not, she did not have a short financial runway. She had a very long financial runway, but she did have a very short emotional runway. So I said, okay, so let's walk through the scenario. Um, you are given an opportunity for, uh, the, you're given the offer for this first job. You haven't heard anything, you know, moving forward on the second job. If you refuse the first job because you're hoping for the second one and the second one doesn't come through, I want you to stop for a minute and tell me exactly how you will feel the morning after you get up and are told that the second job isn't that you're not going to get it. How are you going to feel when you turn down the first job? And she said, I would be devastated. I would be absolutely devastated. I said, okay, then the answer is you're going to take the first job. You're going to accept the opportunity. Um, we were fortunate with her because she could delay her start date um, by a few weeks because she already had a, 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 a trip plan that was outside of the country. So we accepted the first job. They had to do the background check and all of that. So that was going on. She went on her merry way to um, her, her uh, destination. She was going to visit her family outside of the United States. And the second one started to heat up again. And as a matter of fact, we were talking and coaching by a WhatsApp because it was the only mechanism to talk to her um, where she was um, to get her ready for the final interviews for the second role. And guess what? She wound up going through there while she was outside the country. The other a position was still in process and then actually had finally been finalized, but her start date wasn't until, um, I think it was about a week after she came back and she got the second offer. It was for $100,000 more. It had a bigger bonus by far. It will set her up for a, when, when you think about any increases off of a $100,000 increase in salary. And the first company was lowballing the, the compensation and they knew it. Um, and the perks, there, there were all kind, everything about the role was better, including the fact that one was in a stagnant industry, the other one was in a growing industry and it got her into healthcare, um, actually a pharmaceutical company where she had been in uh, an industry that was not thriving and, and necessarily going to be as robust as pharmaceutical will be in this country for a long time to come. Um, and, and she said, I, I, I don't know what to do about the first one. And I said, take control of your destiny. This is your business decision. This is a business decision. Now it's not an, it feels emotional, but you need to contact them. And the truth is you don't have to say, I'm, I'm not coming to work for you because I have a different and better offer. You're saying the more I have thought about coming to your, to that role, the more I have realized that I should not have accepted it is not the right role for me. It wasn't. Um, and so we, we talked about the role. Interestingly enough, and if you're sitting there thinking, oh, this is terrible, I would never be able to do that. Um, it was a really unique situation. I said, to, by the way, they're going to be furious. They're going to be furious for about a week. And then they're going to move on to the second place candidate or the internal that they were going to promote. And if you go there, you would be miserable for a lot longer than a week and you would have turned down the opportunity for the higher compensation and a much, much better future in that other company. Why would you do that? So one of the dilemmas she had, and this is just to bring this whole picture home to you, one of the dilemmas she had was that her, um, her the person who had, there was somebody who she used to report to, a CEO who she reported to, who made an introduction to somebody inside of the first company that made her the offer. And that person is the one who got her resume to the opportunity. So she said, I have a real dilemma because that CEO is a reference for my second job. And now I have to call him and say, oh my God, I'm devastated, but this is what's happened. And I said, he's not going to be, he's not going to be upset at all. Trust me. So she called me back after and she said, I called him and she said, I was going on and on. I feel so terrible, but this is what happened. He said, stop it. This is just a business decision for God's sakes. I would have taken the second job. Don't worry about him. He'll get over it. It's exactly right, right? You, you have to control your destiny. So that's an outside. Inside, 
you have to be really alert to the changes that are going on. You have to constantly be setting yourself up really setting yourself up, really watching. I was talking about the gentleman at Cisco. I've been coaching him for a number of years. So we started at a time when uh, disruption was crazy at Cisco. And since then, we have moved him through four different roles and finally got him jumped over to the cloud side of the business where it's much more um, stable and much more the future of the company, right? So we controlled his destiny. He had opportunities, they wanted him to stay here. And I will tell you that we set things up so that every time he went to the annual meeting um, for their, um, their kickoff meeting, uh, every time he did that, he had three to five interviews set up with other department heads inside of the company to talk about internal positions that potentially might be coming up so that he was completely in the driver's seat, even though um, certainly his, his current, he's very successful, he's, he's a, a, performs exceptionally well, nobody wanted to let him go. And instead of saying, I really need to support him, he's, you know, he's gonna be there. And, and in the years that he has continued to move around, from the time that I started coaching him, it's actually, we're going on five years now. When I started coaching him, um, he had a group of peers, all of whom have been jettisoned from the company because they stayed in, in place to support their group, to support this. And the, um, the, uh, the company changed, the business changed and they were not needed. This was a time when they were laying off $12,000, 12,000, 12,000 people at a, at a, at a pitch when they had, had reorganization. So you want to realize that nobody will care as much about your career as you do. And when they're saying, just sit tight, we're going to get some, we're going to have some movement over here and we'll be able to move you around. Don't worry just nod your head and say, thank you very much, but take, take it at face value that until that actually happens, it's just a promise, okay? Um, I, want, I want everybody to realize that um, internal training and development is designed to make you very good at doing that job for that company. That's the basics of it, right? Um, there are certainly good companies that make, you know, pay for uh, MBAs and for further uh, uh, education. And I'm not, I am not um, discounting the fact that there's some good learning and development opportunities and, and perks in there, right? But at the end of the day, um, when I talk about self-directed learning, I really revert back to, you know, um, you take Toys R Us, which is now for sure trying to resurrect itself at, at Macy's. But um, when, when you look at a company like that and they were providing learning and development for the people inside the company, they were providing it based on a mistaken point of view that they had anyways. Their strategy um, was not working. Um, I know everybody says, oh, but they were loaded with debt. Yes, that was a big part of it, but they got loaded with debt because they insisted that people were still going to walk into a great big giant box store and run around and, and shop for kids' toys when in fact, the, the UPS truck was whizzing by the store every day, dropping toys off at homes, right? Um, with Amazon. So what I, when you look at a gigger, what they do is they, they always stay one trend ahead of whatever it is that they're in there consulting on, or, or if they're a digital marketing person, they're knowing what's the next digital mess, uh, um, messenger that's gonna come out, the next digital uh, wave that's gonna come. So they, they by definition, are hired to be on the bleeding edge of their area of expertise. But when we get inside of a company, we get either locked down to, I know how to do this job and I'm gonna do it, or we only engage in the learning that's being presented to us. And then when FinTech and, and InsureTech and EduTech come along, we don't know very much about it. We, there's that crypto stuff. I don't know what that's all about. We don't take the time to get to indulge in it as well as, any other kind of self-directed learning, for example, knowing more about data analytics, even though that may not be your area of expertise, like that's what's going to be driving much of the decision making, much of what's going on inside of companies, AI and all of that, right? So my request is that you set aside 10% of your own, you know, after tax income and invest that in your own self-directed learning based on where you think 
your industry or the next industry that you're interested in is headed and the skills that are needed. And one of the best ways to do this is that once you've landed, you continue to look at job descriptions, not, you know how I don't like, anybody knows me, knows I don't like the job boards for any other thing that when you see job descriptions and you just go on once a quarter and you pull down three or four job descriptions of the next kind of the, either your, the role you're in or the next role that you would be seeking or be interested in and see what the requirements are. Now, I have a client that said, if I had done that, I would have known how far behind I was on digital before I did. Because by the time I realized how far behind I was, I was out, I was job hunting, and everybody wanted me to have what I didn't have. And I just, it didn't come onto my radar right where I was, right? So you look at job descriptions to see what requirements are they making for, for, for future, as you, as you look into the future and make sure that your self-directed learning engages you in getting um, understanding of those new skills and expertise. And today that doesn't mean you have to go to, you know, a, a, a college and spend thousands of dollars. There is so much inexpensive ways to get on. And I'm not even talking about having to have certifications. It's less about the certification. It's interesting when you're out of a job and you get a certification, and you think it's going to help you in your job search, most of the time it doesn't help as much because you're going up against somebody with certification and experience, right? So you've just got the certification. If you get the training and ongoing while you're inside the role and you say, well, I've done a lot of, um, I've studied digital, I've done this, I've studied the um, global markets, et cetera, you, whatever it is that, you, that you've engaged in, they're not as, as concerned about the, the certification for the most part, I mean, there's we, we know that CPA has a value in some of those. I'm talking about going forward. Um, they will will look at the um, at the experience that you had, and you know how this new expanded area, um, and it, it counts for so much more. So use um, job postings that you see to help, and, and other things that you see on um, association sites. I don't. Somebody said to me. They were advertising something that I needed to engage in and I paid no attention to it. I thought I'm set. I don't need that. And now I wished I had done that. Right. So be be on top of it. And and the, the last and most important thing. And I just had somebody reach out to me and say, I've got my 401 me plan in place. Right. So you giggers always have a self built you know, safety net because they only have what they're bringing in. That's what they, it, it, they shoot with, um, they, they eat what they kill rather, right? So they always have, whether it's 90 days, six months, 12 months, a lot of times what I see is that um, really a, a, a true safety net that allows you to say, there's two parts to me of the safety net. There's a financial safety net and there's the network safety net. Both of those give you the confidence so that if, the job isn't working out, if the work isn't working out, if you're not happy where you are and you're in control, you know that you have a nest egg that, that you can use to um, for your safety net. Besides your 401k, which is in many instances, if you touch it, you're going to pay a penalty. It's going to have um, a distraction from a, a detraction from you. So the 401k is, is most people max it out. And, and my thing is if you have to if you, if in maxing out your 401k, you don't have enough to set aside for your learning and development and your, um, and having your own safety net in case there was a, a surprise that you completely didn't anticipate, um, then I would put less in the 401k and have that little piece that you, that you hand out, that you keep out. The person who wrote to me and said, I have my 401, I, I feel so much more confident that I don't have to put up with things here now. I know that I can have a very different point of view about the way I'm, I'm handling my career internally because I have, I have my network safety net and I have my financial safety net, right? So it's, it's a different way of thinking. It's fundamentally changing. Listen, those of you in finance, you know that the company wants you to max out your 401k because it benefits them when you max out their 401, you max out your 401k, right? Um, but I want you to know that you want to have a, a penalty-free nest egg that gives you the confidence combined with a, a, um, a nest egg of, of contacts and, um, and visibility inside of the companies that are the next places you want to go so that you're ready for understanding that you're going to have this three to five year gig is what it's going to last. Um, and that is absolutely now that I've been doing this, I've seen people come through their second cycle of the three years and out and three years and out. 
Um, it's just happening, right? So those are the, the, the major main things. Now, here's the thing. You remember what I said in the beginning? You gotta be able to be willing to say, I am not going to work till 10 o'clock at night and weekends just for my job. I'm going to carve out time for this. Now, when I'm onboarding my clients, the time that we carve out is minimal. Because you remember I said in the beginning, you know, you're working when you're doing a full-time job search, it's six, seven, eight hours a day sometimes, right? It's exhausting. When you're doing it a little bit at a time and you're executing a, a, a good recruiter strategy and you're maintaining your network and you're keeping always having a list of target companies, what are the next companies that are going to be the movers and shakers? This, the amount of time that we allot to that is somewhere between 15 and 30 minutes a week. So 15 and 30 minutes a week, because you're just doing a little bit at a time over a year is a lot of time invested. And I, I know that for most people that when I challenge them in a, in a, um, a workshop like this and say, before you lost your last role, if, if you've been in transition, um, how much time where you get on your calendar dedicated any week to what was going to be next after that role. And most of them said, none, not at all. And, and I'm not, again, I'm not saying carve out an hour every day, carve out three hours a week. Nope. 15 to 20 minutes doing it consistently for 52 weeks. At the end of the year, you will be shocked at how ready willing and able you will be for something else. If the surprise happens and somebody walks in and says, Sorry, Mike, but we're going in a different direction. That's all it takes for 15 to 20 minutes a week versus seven to eight hours a day for, for the weeks and weeks that it takes to land a new role. It's a, it's a much better trade-off in terms of time investment. And the only reason you don't do it, let me tell you, trust me, is it takes a, it takes a mind shift. It takes a, an, a habit shift and an attitude shift of understanding I've got to do this. I'm going to make that 15 minutes for some of my clients um, now, especially because some of them are starting to travel again that have landed, um, landed in a role. As I said, travel and landing at the same time, right? Um, what I've, I've just challenged them is, look, when you get on the plane and every don't, don't count how much luggage is going into the overhead, take a minute to get, get set up and, and work on your target list and set up some of the activities. We, we have a list of activities that they do when they're in a place where they can't, you know, for that time, you can't get on the internet. Um, and it's like, oh, that worked out great. I carved out 15 minutes on my flight out. I carved out 15 minutes on my flight back. I'm done for the week. Everything's great, right? So don't make it a big thing. It's little, little moments, but it, it is going to be the best, best investment of your time once you land that you will ever, ever make. And it will keep you from ever, what I call being in the net again. I call it the net because I think of the trapeze artist, you know, and they, they swing back and forth and they send out the, the new um, trapeze for them to jump onto. And sometimes they miss the trapeze and land in the net and it takes a long time to get back out. I want you always to be ready for that other trapeze to be coming at you and that you just glide onto that, have a, a safe landing and then unfortunately, because this is the way the world is now, begin to work on what will be next. And it's, and it's actually becomes, for, for a lot of my clients, it's become fun because they go, yeah, I've, I've discovered this over here and I didn't even know that existed because now I'm being curious about what other roles are there while I'm doing this role here, right? So change of, change of mindset, but um, makes a huge difference. So I hope that this has been helpful. Um, this is just a, a, a very smattering. My, um, just so you know, my, my Onboard a Bulletproof program is 12 months because we carve out the first 90 days is just in case you want to execute yourself. The first 90 days is mostly it's about 80, 20 focus on their current role and getting fire hose and getting established and making a good impression and making the list of who do they need to know and who needs to know them inside the company. Um, and then as the year expands, by the time we get to the end of the year that that of the 12 months, it's 2080. 20% of our concentration is what's going on inside the company and 80% is what's going on external because we've already got a good um, um, internal foundation and framework for what's happening inside the company. Um, and, and in that year with some of those that I've been through for um, uh, uh, you know, clients that we've already been through a year or almost through a year, most of them have had at least one, if not two or three internal disruptions that have blown the business up. 
um, and been able to to stay in there, but knowing that, whoops, that just reminds me, I'm going to do that 30 minutes this week or 20 minutes this week or 15. So I hope it's helpful. Um, it's a lot to digest and it's a real fundamental change. And that's why it takes a year to really get it nailed and really get smooth in it. Okay, thank you. So I have one question in the chat already. Um, would the person like to ask it themselves or you want me to ask a question for you? If you want to ask yourself, you can see yourself. Questions, one from Debbie. I just, I think she didn't proceed it with question. No, 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 she, I already have Debbie. So Debbie, do you want to ask your question or should we go ahead? And thank you, Pat. By the way, everyone, just so you know, Pat has her meeting every Thursday night at 7.45 Eastern time. And she gets over 800 people on there. And it's the same thing. Everybody's networking in the chat and people have gotten each other jobs from that. Totally. So, so I do recommend that you get on that for Thursday nights. And uh, the link is bulletproofyourcareer.com. Yeah, so, you, so it's bulletproof. Your, so it, you can still register for tonight. I've been doing it for three, over three years, every single Thursday. Um, I do a workshop in the beginning and then I open it up to Q and A and the chat is open the whole time. Um, and if you wanted to even register for tonight, you just go to bulletproofyourcareer.com backslash Zoom and there's a registration form. And when you fill that out, you'll get the link to the, to the Zoom call. Um, I think we're averaging right now during the, uh, the COVID, we had 950 something was our peak. Um, and then we, as, as we've had over 1400 people land um, from the Zoom group, just between, we had 297 land in um, 2020 that were in part of the community. And um, I haven't got tonight's figures added in here, but I will by the time we get on our call. Um, but right now we had, um, just to give you an idea, we had 1,143 people from our Zoom community have landed in 2021, right? And every one of them are helping other people get into companies and make introductions. That's that's 1,400 between the two years um, doors that are open to them because of people that they knew in there. So um, we do a, um, a, a full workshop and then Q&A every single week. So anybody's welcome to join, love to have you. Yeah. And, and uh, let me just quickly, um, because I know I'm, I'm going to have to jump and some people might have to jump. Um, what I was talking about before, if you, if you, first of all, anybody who's on here, if you want to connect with me on LinkedIn, please feel free to do that. I am very generous with my network. I'm happy to make introductions. If you have an opportunity and you know somebody that I know, and I can help you make that introduction, I'm willing to do, always willing to do that. Um, so please connect with me. And I also have a private LinkedIn group that is non-published. And a lot of the folks that have landed are starting to post jobs in there all the time because so many people that have landed are hiring or their company's hiring. Um, so it's a it's Bulletproof Your Career private LinkedIn group. And um, that's not the only thing that's in there, but um, there's discussion and I post things in there as well, but it's also a good, a good venue. Um, and then what if you're connected to me, um, and you're interested in understanding more about the, uh, they call it a book club. It's really what I've done is turn my, my book into a really immersive course. Um, so it's a, a 28 day uh, course. It's 14 minutes a day of coursework that takes you through the book, through extra exercises, there's extra videos and there's discussion. There's a discussion board in there. So it is sort of like a virtual book club and talking with others who are in the book, book club So. Okay, and that so, actually, I think the landing page for that will be up. I'll, I'll, I'll send the link to you, um, Leora, because I think um, the landing page for that will be up tomorrow. Okay, great. Yeah. So we have another 15 minutes because I need five minutes in the end for announcements. So let me start with the question. So Debbie, uh, her question was, you are speaking about staying ahead of the trends and disruptions in your company and industry. You also gave great examples of where people didn't see it. How do you make sure you see it? Well, I always say companies don't change overnight, they change over time, right? Um, and so it's a matter of, you would be surprised once you start just changing your mindset to things could be disrupted here. I had somebody say, I, I don't know, I saw, I saw all these changes. I saw three people come and go in this one department. Um, I don't know why I didn't see, because they just weren't looking. So first of all, let's just pay attention. Um, I have a document which, um, 
I'll include also in the follow-up, it's called the clarity document that my clients do. And, and for those that I'm onboarding, I make them take that document out every 90 days. And it gives you clarity on what um, the clarity is, what you're looking for in a job, what makes you know, a good boss, what makes a good company. But here's what happens. Um, when you take that out every 90 days and you look at it, I've already had somebody call me and say, well, I took it out 90 days. Everything was just the same. In other words, they chose that company because it matched up well to the clarity. Diet. Well, Denver matches up 100%, but it matched up well. 90 days later, everything was still the same. Six months later, they said, I started to see some things changing. I started to see some disconnects. So it's just a matter of the two things I have my clients do every 90 days is update their resume. I don't care if you just take it out and go, well, nothing's really changed. I'll add, just maybe add this one accomplishment. I always have an updated resume. Every 90 days is, is a good safety net um, uh, time frame, um, And it's fresh in your mind and all of that. And then having um, awareness. But when you see leadership changes, when, when you're watching, here's what happens. It's such a great question because I want you not just watching what's going on inside your company. That's what most people do. They say, well, I saw this and I saw that, but I didn't realize it was going to disrupt. Trust that it probably will. But more importantly, watching what's going on in the competition. Who are the who are the unicorns coming up to nip your, your, the heels of your own company? So that's why paying attention to the industry, you may, maybe nobody inside is even recognizing it, right? There are plenty of companies that never saw it coming, right? But when you're lo looking going, you know what? That company has introduced four products and we don't have any of the features in those four products. We're, we're gonna be a little bit at a disadvantage. Those are signals that you need to be really watching closely. So it's not just, it certainly is leadership changes and people changes, but because um, that often is a change of direction, um, especially if you're inside a company that, you know, the board's not happy, they're not making their number, et cetera, et cetera. When they change leadership, they expect leadership to make other changes, so. Okay, great. Now, James has a question as well. Hi, Pat. Uh, thank you for a great presentation once again. Thank you. Um, I, I, you were speaking about uh, certifications and, and courses and, things that, you know, may have value. And, you know, I was recently on a, a Wall Street Journal's job summit where they, they spoke about that and the number of certifications that there are out there and it's something like close to a million right now. Yep. Um, so with that in mind, right, um, when you're looking, and, and even if you're looking at job postings and, and they write down, oh, you know, this desirable this, this knowledge on this system or the, that system, there's so many platforms, business intelligence, yeah. you know. Yeah. How do you really identify what's worth investing your time that's going to allow you to become at least marketable for enough time? Yeah. So one thing is you're looking at trends, not, not individual. In other words, it, that's why I want you to look at job over time and look at several because, mm -hmm. you know, this one may ask for something that's particular. Um, right. I remember back in the day when they said um, knowledge of workday is preferred. Now, if you don't know Workday, don't apply, right? And right. that was starting to be, that, was, that, that groundswell was starting to happen, right? So Workday was coming in and taking over and it was very subtle, but it was starting to show up. And the next thing you know, it wasn't very long before it was in every, every job description. So it's, it's sort of um, a canary in a coal mine when you first, first see it. And then you kind of keep track and say, this is coming up many times, right? So I, I need to pay attention to that. Um, the other thing I would say, is that if your aspiration is also to be growing more in leadership role, right? To ascend up and have larger teams, you're, you're gonna see subtle things in those job descriptions, but you need to know that less the technical expertise, less the certification, and more is going to be that you are, you, you come to them well equipped to manage large global hybrid diverse teams, right? Because that's what, at that point, they're looking for leadership skills, right, leadership right. qualities, right? right? And that's not a certification per right, se, right, right, right. Right. right? Yeah. Okay. Does that right. makes sense? Yeah, absolutely. So Pat, I have a question for you. What if you have a boss who is um, trying to take credit for your work and you want others to know in the company that you are doing all this work? How do you do it without going over their head or getting them upset, so to speak. Yeah, it's it's very hard to, to answer that question generally because 
Um, I, I mean, here's a really good example. The, the gentleman that I talked about at the grocery store, we had to worry about that. He actually had a pretty insecure boss um, and she wasn't necessarily not going to give him credit necessarily, but um, she also wasn't amplifying his, what he was doing at all. But we, it was sort of like we took the Columbo approach, like, oh, you know, I reached out to, to this person and I thought that they could benefit from knowing that. And she said, oh, what a great idea. They probably could use it. And it's like, well, it also turned out that I planted the seed and we got over to the CEO, but she never really saw it coming. And now she, and by the way, by that time when the CEO, he reported to her when the CEO was like, this is the greatest thing since sliced bread. She didn't take credit for it. She couldn't because he had already been there, but she was super supportive of it. Right. Um, but it does depend. I mean, I coach a lot of people through not that was pretty dramatic, but we, we needed to do that. We wanted to get him a promotion, but um, I think that in, in other situations, it's, it's often it's, you have to be careful about um I'm not a big believer in everybody gets CC'd so that everybody knows, right? But it, it, it's really a situational by situational. And I hate to be, I'm not trying to be evasive, but I have to, we had to know the personality, the, the um, um, dynamics internally and the politics internally to know who to go to, to get that information where we needed it to go. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. And sometimes, you know, working. there's, there's that's when you see somebody inside taking um, a lot of credit and you don't find a, a way around that tells you that you really need to amp up your 50 minutes a day to 20 or 50 minutes a week to 30 minutes a week. Cause who wants to be in that environment and you don't need to be take control. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else have any last questions before we wrap up and we start with announcements? Nothing else. And thank you so much, Pat. Yeah, really you're welcome. I'm going to create a little, a little um, Dropbox. It'll probably be tomorrow because I've got to jump on my uh, uh, Zoom call in a little bit. Um, and I've got to go, go get my throat a rest. Um, but uh, I'll create and, and get some stuff done, but I'll create a, a Dropbox with some follow-up that I think and hope will be helpful. So yes, thank you. And everybody right. remember that it's going to be tonight at 745 and it's at Bulletproof Your Career backslash Zoom. Yep. And if you want to connect with me, please feel free. It's so great to meet you all, even though virtually I had intended to go up to New York in 2020 and you know how that ended, um, but maybe 2023 or 2022. We'll see. Okay, guys, take okay. care. Thank, Thank you, you so you. much, Pat. You're okay. welcome. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Now. Bye -bye. Yeah. So everyone also, please, before you drop off, I want you to save the chat. You have the three um, little dots on the bottom. I also put in the chat how to save the chat, but let me announce who we have next week. Uh, next month, we have Michael Chappelle. He's a partner at Ruben and Brown. This will be on November 11th on Thursday at 5 p.m. Why are you not getting that job? Michael will share the most common mistakes job seekers make in the following areas, resumes, networking, interviews, Zoom and video, follow-up, online presence. Okay, also, uh, Joyce has already put in the chat about the job club. So we need three, four more people, we have openings so people can actually join job clubs now. Remember that it is still virtual, so it doesn't really matter the location. It's still in the tri-state area, mostly the New York, New Jersey area. So you do have people that can help you uh, network into these companies and also it keeps you accountable. And people have landed, we have a very good landing rate on it. Um, so also remember, we are still virtual, so you can still join other chapters worldwide, not just in the US, but worldwide. Um, I've joined chapters already in France and in London and elsewhere in the US. And if there's any interesting speaker that you see, you're allowed to sign up on the FANG website to join their Zooms as well. And also please uh, remember to invite your colleagues to join the FANG. The more people we have, the better it is for us to network. Please use our database to network into jobs. If you're looking for a certain company, check the FANG database first, and maybe you'll have someone there who currently works there or just recently left there and has connections or insight for you. Um, also, remember we have our YouTube channel that you can look at past videos, not only from our chapter, but also other chapters. Not every one is recorded, but for the most part, they are. And again,